time for the newspaper review. Sally and I are going to take a look at the stories making headlines and we'll begin with what many of the papers are covering, which is the diplomatic efforts being made over the Ukraine crisis. The Moscow Times has talks between the leaders of Russia, France and Germany. German Chancellor Angela Merkel is due to meet US President Barack Obama, where Ukraine is likely to be high on the agenda. Now, uh, let's quickly whistle through some of the other ones. We can't bring you graphics at the moment, but The Guardian, its entire front page is dedicated to the investigation I was discussing earlier with Cornelian to HSBC's Swiss banking arm. This paper looks at leaked files showing bankers helped some clients evade tax. Let's just jump into it, shall we, Cornelia? Welcome back. Um, we'll begin with the Moscow Times and um, obviously across all the papers, Vladimir Putin meeting with Jan Chancellor Angela Merkel and French President Francois Hollande late Friday night. And um, we saw this picture, it looked very hostile, didn't it? There were very few smiles and there's very little optimism I think, at the moment, after international talks over the weekend. Yeah, the body language was not exactly friendly, was it? But um, when you look at it, there was, a, there was an agreement reached on September 4th or 5th in Minsk, um, a, a ceasefire with a demilitarized zone, and it didn't amount to anything. It, it, it couldn't be implemented. So this is, this is yet another attempt. Um, it's probably very good that Angela Merkel is taking the lead because she speaks Russian. She grew up in eastern Germany. She understands. She knows exactly. You know, Mr. Putin was station chief in Dresden for the KGB. She, she, they, they, they can deal with each other. So let's see where this this gets and um, they said they will meet if they can get anywhere. What I think is not helpful though is that some of the Anglo-Saxon countries, some of the you know, foreign ministers sort of make very sort of derogatory comments on the negotiations. Let's just get these negotiations going and seeing where they go. Well it's interesting to look at how the West as a whole, if you say, some say is split when you look at the US saying that it wants to arm Ukrainian forces yep. and John Kerry, Secretary of State, US Secretary of State saying absolutely there's no split in Europe but you couldn't be, Angela Merkel couldn't make it more clear that she doesn't want this to happen because it's, it will be the ultimate um, start to the ex escalation of tension. Absolutely and don't forget for the US it's easy to say let's arm, let's arm the Ukraine. The US is very far away. Germany is very close. So if you are Germany, you want your backyard to be peaceful. So she will put every effort in it. And France has every interest um, in getting along with Germany. So the French and the Germans are going to put every effort into trying to make it work. The one thing that will be difficult, or the one question I have is, how much power does Putin really have over the separatists? Because you know, once you have these, these, these militias, these non-state actors, they suddenly things take a dynamic of their own. So so, so that's another thing is even if they come to an agreement, how enforceable is it? Because mm -hmm. that's where, where it got stuck last time. Now The Guardian, uh, the whole front page is, is given over to this um, look into HSBC's private banking division um, which was operating within the Swiss system. We've talked about it already, yeah. uh, Cornelia. For journalists and for the press, obviously they are very interested in all the detail, but actually for the bank they feel we've dealt with this, we've moved on. Well, for the bank, they've dealt with this, they've moved on. But you know, when things like this end in the press, it's never good PR for a bank. It's never good, thing, good PR for an institution when they, an, when they end up negatively mentioned in the press. But from, I think from an official standpoint, probably HSBC is, you know, is out, of the, out of the bad zone, but some of the people named may not be. Okay, let's move on to the Financial Times. You've discussed HSBC quite a lot in, the, in World Business Report and it's something that I think is going to continue to be um, discussed as well. Um, Financial Times taking a look at the City of London split on Europe. So what's happening obviously is that Britain's relationship with Europe has been in the spotlight, it's going to remain in the spotlight, especially as we're now in electioneering period, the uh, May the 7th marks the UK general election. While all this discussion goes on, there are certain investment vehicles that think, actually, is it worth us being in here? Can you explain what the Financial Times is looking well, at? Well, the Financial Times says, look, all the investment banks say, basically, if Britain should leave Europe, um, a lot of the firms will leave as well because one, the, the benefit they get is they invest, they, they, they are in Britain and they have access to the huge European market, which they will no longer have if, if Europe leaves. Some of the hedge funds think differently. 
but they would think differently because what do investment banks do? Investment banks, they advise on mergers and acquisitions. They do the big bond trades. Hedge funds, they invest more in niches. And it's, um, some of them invest in, in, in commodity trades and things, but some of them invest in niches. And for some of them, that, that sort of volatility created may not be a bad thing. So it's, it's, it's a bit horses for courses here. I mean, they're sort of, uh, the hedge funds are saying, look, it's expensive, the regulation is time consuming, it's a massive hindrance it's bureaucracy and when you say you know <clears throat> we wouldn't have access to a huge market we would still have access to the market it would just we, be we, the relationship would be the, different. We, the relationship would be different and we wouldn't have the, the you know the free movement of goods trade services would no longer exist I mean it's it would then have to be renegotiated and why would the hedge funds say this the hedge funds are not regulated not really regulated investment banks are now regulated globally basically the same way and the hedge highly. funds <laughs> and quite highly and the hedge funds sort of have gone have gone sort of have, have sort of slipped through and the EU has big attempts of regulating them more and I think rightfully so this, this is the one segment which controls billions and billions of dollars which is unregulated or underregulated. I mentioned that we're in the run-up to a general election I mean if you're in the UK you can't avoid it so let's be very careful with this story the windfall for pensioners in Osborne bond boost so the front page of the Times is taking a look at this bond issue um, for over 65s and it's to enjoy better savings rates there was a flood a rush for these bonds when they were first released and now they've been extended um, it comes down though doesn't it to the fact that savers of late the past few years really haven't enjoyed the benefits of lower interest rates <laughs> Absolutely. If you're saving, you need interest rates. And you know, I mean, even here when you say these bonds, 2.8%. Um, yielding 2.8 percent or if you stay in it for four years four percent that's really not much you know imagine if you put <coughs> in ten thousand pounds and you get four percent it's better than half a percent much. though isn't it? it's better than half a percent but it really is the flip side of the, it's the flip side of the story yes we need low interest rates to get the economy going um, but on the other hand if you're a pensioner and you've saved all your lifetime and you get no reward for it. You started saving when interest rates were 7%, 8%, and now they're nothing. The whole paradigm has shifted and you're left out in the cold. Now we're right in the middle of the award season and uh, many newspapers have got the BAFTA winners on the front page. Eddie Redmayne and Julianne Moore are picked out on the Independent. Of course it's Sam Smith that's been getting lots of gongs overnight yeah. at the Grammys. Um, give us your thoughts on some of our winners so far this year. Are you a Wait, cinema goer? Um, no, I, I was actually, I actually think um, um, Eddie Redmayne was, was, was fantastic and I've so heard him, I've, I've heard him, I've seen bits of the film, mm -hmm. but I've heard him sort of talk how he, he got, went over the medical reports and learned when which muscle went and really studied it and really did so much work in making sure that he portrayed it correctly. Mm -hmm. And I was very, 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 very happy um, about, about um, uh, Julianne Moore because if you look at it, Alzheimer's is such an important part becoming such an important part of our of our life of our narrative that um, having that portrayed and apparently portrayed very well is probably a very good thing do you think the British complain enough <laughs> no, no, I don't. Well, apparently, I don't. Apparently, Brits are doing online. Online, online yes. But telephone. I will never. I'm British, as you know. But I wasn't, <laughs> wasn't born in this country, <laughs> and I will never forget. At some stage, I was on a British Airways flight, and they didn't give me water, and I said, "I want water now." And everybody was like, oh, "What is she doing?" So the British, it's it's not a done thing to complain, um, which is why we always have. Um, trains going late and, and, and all of these things so good on us that we are complaining now and late absolutely time. if we can't do it face to face we can do it the coward's way brilliant <laughs> it's not cowardly we were right <laughs> thank you so much for joining us sally and i see you very very soon do have a lovely day bye-bye